Howdy! This is Soren with Cartoon Universe. If you're wondering why you haven't heard my voice before, it's because this is my first video on the channel. Today, I'm going to talk about the newest episode of Infinity Train's second season, The Black Market Car. This 11-minute episode is jam-packed with things that make me ecstatic for the season to come. With Tulip now safe and sound back at home, it seems the series is now going to follow the adventures of Mirror Tulip, who is Tulip's spunky, parkour-loving reflection come to life. The episode starts in a strange, forge-like room, with dead rabbits laying across the floor. The rabbit who attacks MT, only to be violently flung into a wall, seems to indicate that the dead rabbits are MT's doing. She then sets a pen on a chain on a nearby surface and spray paints it black, which is something she proceeds to do to every reflective surface she sees in the episode moving forward. She changes out of her reflective clothes and changes into new ones. She personalizes her shirt by ripping off the sleeves. We also see MT move the multi-tool, which enables her to exist in the prime world, to a hidden spot on her body under her shoe, which implies that that multi-tool may be some form of weakness or vulnerability for MT. She then uses a rotating wheel on the outside of a train car to sand her hair off by leaning backwards onto it. Oh my god. <laughs> it seems that just like her prime counterpart, Mirror Tulip is almost completely fearless. She spends time walking through other cars, which implies that some amount of time has passed. It's hard to say how much time has passed between the ending events of Book 1 in this episode, or how much time has passed between her cutting her hair and the later events in this episode. Since Mirror Tulip is not an organic life form, it's hard to tell whether or not her physical form can do things like age and regrow hair, which may make it hard to have a sense of continuous time within this season. Then again, Tulip was an organic life form, and she didn't seem to change or age during the events of Book 1 either, even though Amelia confirms that people are capable of aging on the train when she says, If you do not take your exit now, I'll send it so far down the train that you'll die of old age before you see it again. Hmm. Anyways, back to the breakdown. MT finds herself in the black market car, a car filled with strange slime creatures who are all exchanging their wares in, well, a black market. The black market car seems very reminiscent of the cantina scene in the Star Wars universe. One vendor is seen selling passenger memory tapes, which she points out are real sad. We can see that she is selling a whopping 59 memory tapes, and yes, I counted. <laughs> Okay, I have so many questions. First of all, do tapes continue to exist for passengers after they've left the train, or do tapes only exist for passengers who are currently present on the train? Furthermore, how many tapes end up on the black market? How do they get to the black market? Where do the tapes come from? How are they created? How do they travel across trains? Also, what are they worth financially? What is the economic structure of the entire train even like? Everything seen so far seems to suggest that the train possesses a barter-based economy, but is there anything that could be seen as an equivalent to money in the context of the train's world? <sighs> so many questions, so few answers. I'll make an episode breaking down the economics of the Infinity Train eventually, just you wait. Moving on, the tape vendor takes an interest in Mirror Tulip's shininess and holds up a looking glass so that it can get a closer look at her. This sends MT into a panic. She swats the looking glass to the ground, but before she can spray paint over it, the dreaded Agent Sieve and Agent Mace leap out of the tiny, broken shards of glass left on the floor and give chase to MT. I'm not gonna lie. The fact that two full-grown mirror men managed to enter the prime reality through that small of a surface did throw me off and break my suspension of disbelief for a moment, but I digress. The two agents chase MT through the black market car. In this chase, MT gets to show off just how much of an agile, quick-thinking badass she is. It's interesting how well both MT and Tulip seem to be equally as intelligent. MT exhibits far more spatial and physical intelligence, where Tulip seems to tend towards a purely intellectual form of intelligence. MT escapes the black market car and runs into a car that contains a beautiful fall forest. Before the two agents enter the room, she hides behind a deer. Though she initially doubts and regrets her snap decision to do so, the deer then turns invisible, which indicates to me that said deer may have some sense of intuitive understanding of the things happening around it. The agents enter the room and determine they've lost MT's trail. They decide to head back to their base due to the fact that Agent Mace's suit has a tear in it. Agent Mace goes on to say that if the tear gets any bigger, he'll be a goner. 
This may foreshadow that MT will defeat the agents in the future by further damaging or compromising their suits. As they leave, Agent May says that the last couple of months spent tracking MT have been a truly great bonding experience. Woohoo! My obsession with knowing how much time has passed has been satiated. Now, do they mean a couple as in two, or a couple as in five? You can really never know with that phrase. Personally, I think it would be reasonable if people just said a couple when they mean two, and then a few when they mean more than two. Because that would make sense, because a couple means two, but people like to say a couple when they mean a few all the time, and it frustrates me a lot. But I digress. Seriously, though, that annoys me. Anyways, MT begins wandering the car, only to find that the deer is following her around in a very friendly manner. Though she at first insists that she wants to be left alone, the deer persists, and eventually MT gives in to its kindly presence and begins talking to it. The way that she rambles about the chrome car slash mirror world, her struggle with Agent Sieve and Agent Mace, and her need to be her own person, tells me that she hasn't given herself the time to make any friends in her time on the run. I think MT's been pretty lonely. She spends two very heartwarming days hanging out with the deer, only to wake up and find one day that the deer has left her for a new passenger, Jesse. She gets into a fight with Jesse about who the deer belongs to and is actually friends with. Jessie is very happy-go-lucky and seemingly unaffected by MT's anger. I have to say, I love Jessie's goofy, carefree attitude, especially when placed next to MT's somewhat calloused, angry nature. These characters are going to be great foils for each other in the coming season. Jessie names the deer Alan Dracula, much to MT's dismay. After getting into another fight over the name, Alan Dracula falls through the leafy ground, revealing that there seems to be an entire massive tree underneath the forest floor they were standing on. The episode ends with them peering down into the dark hole that the deer left behind, wondering just how they're going to get their fuzzy friend back. Wow, this episode left me with a ton of questions which I will be revisiting in future videos. I am more than excited to see what new information the season will bring. Stay tuned because I will be making breakdown videos for each new release of Infinity Train in this upcoming week. What were your thoughts on the first episode of the season? Tell me in the comments below or tweet your thoughts at me at lovelywhenscramble at twitter.com. I'll see all of you on Tuesday. This is Soren, signing off. Hey everyone, it's Soren one last time, here to thank you for watching this video. If you liked it, consider leaving a like, a comment, and maybe even subscribing. Oh, and don't forget to click that bell next to the subscribe button so you can stay up to date on all our latest content. Ciao!